Hey, if you guys have your Bibles or a Bible app, would you grab them? And we're going to start in 1 Peter, but we're going to jump from 1 Peter to John 1 at some point as well. So 1 Peter is where we're going to start. For most of my life, I have witnessed an approach to evangelism that creates more of an excuse for people to stay away from the religion which they think is known as Christianity. Much of it is based on attempting to prove that Christians are right and everyone else is wrong. Now hear me, I do believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life as we sang it, that he is the only way to the Father. But what I'd like to contend today is that the gospel that Jesus did for you what you could not do for yourself, that you were broken in your transgressions, you were dead in your transgressions, and Christ had to come and save you, that is offensive enough on its own that our approach doesn't have to be as offensive as well. Because so often, if our approach is offensive, they never even hear the message. And so it's so important that we start to understand how we talk to people, how we connect with people, how, many, how much manners we have. How many of you are from the South? Anyone ever lived in the South? Yeah. You guys understand manners. Not us Californians. All right? We don't understand manners. But I want to train us to be question askers. I want to encourage those of us who still maybe haven't made a commitment to Jesus to start to ask questions. Because here's the crazy thing about our God. There is no question too big for our God. And so I want to spend some time as we're in God's Word, continuing the series called Prepared with an Answer. And this has been a series that I wish existed before I was a Christian. I wish this existed so I could actually look into the claims of Christ and that people were prepared with an answer. Because usually when I would engage with someone who claimed they were a Christian, here was their argument. I believe Jesus is God. I said, great, how do you know? Because the Bible says so. How do you know that the Bible's true? Because the Bible says so. And even though there is truth in that, and I want us to look at God's Word, I want us to be equipped with an answer for people that maybe have never spent any time in the church, maybe have spent no time actually uh, questioning what the faith is about. So I think making sure that we, as followers of Jesus, or maybe you're kicking the tires of Christianity today, I believe that when Peter specifically wrote what we're about to read, and when Jesus gave the Great Commission, it wasn't a good suggestion It was what the Lord told us to do, and you and I, if we've been included in Christ, are God's plan A. How awesome is that? That we get to be God's plan A, to see the world reach for the glory of Jesus' name. So I'm going to take us back to the verse that we built much of this series upon. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 15. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. He starts with set apart Christ as Lord. And so I'm going to ask a question to you that I think is the most important question you will ever be asked in this life. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to you? Because without making him Lord, without making him the Lord of your life, you miss the point of everything that the church of Jesus Christ has been built upon. So as we spoke last week, sharing who Jesus is doesn't justify you. Just because you talk about him doesn't necessarily mean you know him because you can do it for all the wrong reasons. And if he isn't the Lord of your life, if you're sharing him with other people, but he isn't God to you, he isn't the Lord, then you're not sharing from firsthand knowledge. So he says, always be prepared. When he says always, he means always, just so we're clear. (laughs) This isn't a piece of advice of what you think about doing one day when it's comfortable for you, but this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that you're always prepared. You're prepared for the battle, and there's a battle, church. You're prepared for following Jesus and all that would entail when he asks you to do things you don't want to do, and prepared for winning others with the gospel towards Jesus. But prepared with what? Well, he says it. Prepared with an answer. And we talked a little bit about this last week, this idea of being prepared and answering questions, and we shouldn't answer questions that we weren't asked. Do you guys get that? Because often in evangelism, or when people go to share who Jesus is, we're constantly answering questions no one ever asked us. 
And there is, as you guys just experienced with that silly exercise, there is an art to asking questions. You have to be thinking ahead while listening to what they say. How difficult is that? So much can be learned. So much can be learned through the art of asking questions, but also listening to the questions that other people ask. And so let me just say something that's logical and simple, and it may be a little offensive to you because of what you do with this, but here, what you talk about most is usually most important to you. So what do you talk about most? This isn't sharing. You're like, me, I talk about me. No, no. But think about what you talk about most. And questions, and we're going to spend more time in this next week, but questions that people are asking, especially if they're asking spiritual questions about our faith, is one of the ways that we can identify if God is drawing someone to himself. And, and here's the other great thing. This is just sociological. People are not that creative. You notice that? Like, you're not that creative. I'm not that creative. So if you and I are in a discussion, and you probably noticed this in the exercise, you asked each other a bunch of the same questions, right? Because we're not that creative. So if I ask you a question, when, when we get that awkward moment in that old Alanis Morissette song, anyone, where it was quiet? No? Just me? Okay, that's fine. Just dated myself. But when there's a pause in the conversation that, it's awkward. And so people just fill in the awkwardness with pretty much the same question you just asked them. And so use that to your advantage. What's really important when we're ask, asking questions of other people is that we actually have a defense if that question is asked back to us. So I want us to talk about following Jesus, but I also want us to see the inquisitive nature of someone who is being drawn by God. And so turn with me to John chapter 1. Turn with me to John chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 35 through about 40-something. John chapter 1. John is a letter written by John, the disciple whom Jesus loves. When John writes in the Bible, in the book of John, he never calls himself John, okay? He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loves. So when he talks about John, he's talking about John the Baptist. He's talking about John the baptizer, if you will. And John the baptizer had come before the Lord, and, and we can look to Isaiah where it says that this messenger from the Lord came to make, path, make the path straight for the Lord to come and preach the gospel and the kingdom. And John the Baptist, where we see John writing about him, has people that are following him. So we pick it up in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look! The Lamb of God. <laughs> I dare you to do that to somebody. No, don't do that. that would... Look, the Lamb of God. Verse 37. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? No, he said, what do you want? And if I had a superpower, here would be my superpower that I wish I could have. You ready? You're like flying. I'm like, no. Understanding tone in Scripture. That's one of the things it doesn't tell us. But I really want to know how Jesus, like, was he, like, annoyed? Like, what do you want? You know, you don't know. Probably not, because he knew they were going to come to follow him. Verse, middle of 38, it says, They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. This is one of my favorite passages when it comes to following Jesus because what we see are people that are inquisitive about Jesus. And so often our evangelism is more trying to accost people with a message rather than having a relationship with someone and already seeing what God is doing. You guys picking up what I'm putting down? And there's this inquisitive nature that these disciples had that were following John because John said this, look, it's the Lamb of God. And it wasn't just that they were inquisitive, but they demonstrated their searching spirit by doing something about their question. You know that some people, like, are wondering about things, but they're so lazy they won't even really Google it? They won't spend any time looking into it. But these men who were following John were like, wait, that's the Lamb of God? I'm going to go follow. I'm going to go ask questions. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So when you see Simon Peter, it means Peter. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did 
was find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. So if you want to underline something in your Bible, here's what you underline. The first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. I want us to talk a little bit in an application point of this text about something, and I'm going to give you a phrase, and it's actually a pun, and I'll explain to you how it's a pun where it has a double meaning, okay? Here's what I want us to be. I want us, those of us who have said yes to Jesus, who are included in Christ, that are part of Church of the Valley, I want us to always be inviting. Always be inviting, and this has a double meaning, and it means a few different things. One of the things it means is that we need to be looking to the needs of the people around us spiritually, Because there are people around us that are far from God and might not even know it. But we need to be looking towards the needs of people around us and we need to invite them to follow Jesus. Let me give you the best question I think I have when it comes to this point. The best question you can ever ask someone that you've built a relationship with, that you've spent time with, is what's stopping you from following Jesus? What's stopping you from following Jesus? If Jesus is who he says he is, that he, he is the son of God, that he lived the perfect life, he died on a cross for our sins, he rose from the dead, if he actually did all the things that he said, why wouldn't we want to follow him? Because when we follow him, when we've trusted him, when we've repented, you know what's amazing? We start to grow to look more like him, which is known as the fruit of the spirit, which means we grow in love. We grow in kindness, we grow in gentleness and goodness and self-control and patience. Anyone want those things? Anyone not want those? Nah, peace? No, don't want any peace. Keep that away from me, preacher, right? Like these are things that we want. And yet so much of our evangelism or telling others about Jesus is more about trying to like get another, I don't know, notch on our belt? I'm not really sure why some people share their faith if it's not to see people actually be conformed into the likeness of Christ. So this idea of being inviting has a double meaning, but it's not just that we invite people to follow Jesus, which honestly some of us should, but it's also that we're inviting people to be a part of a church community, to be a part of God's church. And this isn't me going, man, I just really want to fill this building. No, I don't. That'd be so much work. (sighs) But if people are asking questions, if people are genuinely wanting to know more about Jesus, if people are genuinely wanting to grow more into the likeness of Jesus, let's have 15 services. I don't care. Please no. But, but I want us to be a people that are actually inviting people to be a part of the church because here's what I can promise you. Every week, Jesus' name will be the name that's talked about more than any other name. Every week, we will study right from the Word of God and talk about the things that He says, not just what other people think He said. So here's my question for you. If you consider Church of the Valley your home, here, here's my question. Do you feel that this is a church community that you can invite friends to? Is this a church that you can say, hey, I'd really love for you to come with me to church? Not because the, word, the music is fantastic, not because, you know, you're always checking to see if the young pastor is going to say something he shouldn't. That's not what we're talking about. But are you willing to invite people here because you think that this is a place they can meet Jesus? And let me tell you this, if you don't think this is a church that you can invite people far from God to, I want you and I to talk about that. I want to hear why. But I also want to admit to you, and and this may sting a little, I'm not going to ever, and anyone I ever have teach, will. I will not, we will constantly in prayer never compromise on what this says. We're not going to compromise. And there are times that there are things in this text that we, even I, don't like. I'm like, Lord, couldn't you have done it this way? And the Lord's like, no. (laughs) And we are not going to compromise on what this is. And so if you'd rather be in a place that's, and I'm not calling out any churches, but here's a term that's used. If you'd rather be in a place where it's seeker sensitive, where we spend more time talking about what Oprah thinks rather than Jesus Christ, you've come to the wrong place. Because Jesus is the Alpha, he is the Omega, he is above all things, and he spoke life into existence, and so we listen to what he has to say. So as I said, being inviting has a double meaning, but that doesn't just mean invite to church and invite to follow Jesus. It also means this, you as people of Church of the Valley ought to be an inviting person. So when someone walks onto the campus, smile. 
have manners. Care, I, I know you're like, do you really need to tell us that? Yes, yes I do. And we need to be a people that are inviting so when people not only come to the church, but we represent Jesus Christ, and many of us represent this church as Christ's bride, we should be a people that are inviting and encouraging people to be a part of what God is doing. Can I be honest? Like, I'll start now. Is that okay? <laughs> Younger generation, and, and this was kind of like, you know, a different crowd for a service. <laughs> Younger generation, um, y'all seem entitled. <laughs> I love young people are like, yep, true that. Um, and, and, I don't, and maybe it's not you, but your generation seems entitled. Why don't we get this? We ought to get this. Like, dot com and all these things where people became millionaires overnight, like, it creates a level of entitlement. And that's why we preach the Word of God, because we believe no matter what generation you are that the Word of God can sanctify us and can change us and grow us more into the likeness of Jesus if we would submit to Him. But since I'm being honest, it's not just the younger generation that acts entitled. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's all generations sometimes. People start to make things about them. They start to, start to even make the church about them. And we, we never actually say it out loud, but we basically act as if, hey, I've been here a really long time, and so you should bow down to my preference. Hear me, we will not bow down to anyone but Jesus. If you're taking notes, I recommend this one. The way we act is the best apologetic for who Christ is in our lives. You can have words all day. You can quote verses at people all day like Satan if you want, but the way you live is the best answer. The way you live is the best apologetic, is the best defense for who Christ is. And often in church cultures, especially in a culture like this, guys, because for some of you that have maybe been attending this church for, for a while, maybe before, you know, myself and others got here, when, when I was being installed as the pastor, I remember someone saying this. They said, in the human sense, the idea of two generations, two different cultures coming together should not work. That's, that's what they was said when I was being installed as the pastor. And I kind of appreciate that perspective because based on the world's way of doing things, absolutely right. So in order for two different cultures, two different communities, two different generations to come together and love one another and treat each other like, like blessed children of the God Most High, it will require the Holy Spirit to do the work. Oh, so every time we start to connect a little bit more with someone of a different generation, every time we start to build more of a rapport and more of a relationship, every time I sit down with an 80-year-old at my Pete's Coffee and people are like, is that your grandparent? No, this is my brother. What? <laughs> it starts to create an inquisitiveness. Even Jesus said, people will know you're my disciples by the way that you attend church. Oh, wait, he didn't. He said, by the way that you love one another. So if we treat each other like second-rate citizens because we worship differently or we grew up in a different age or have different priorities, we're essentially spiritual bigots. And I use that word because the other words I wanted to use were a little too strong. And honestly, if that's what we've become, we need to repent. And when I say repent, I don't mean what cultural Christianity calls repentance, which is I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep doing it. No, no, no. My kids get grounded for stuff like that. No, no, no. Repent means you change direction. It means you change your mind. It means you stop doing what you're doing and you start to do what the Lord would have you do. So we need, as the church of Jesus Christ, to be inviting, but also understand that you and I have people in our lives right now that don't just need to attend church. They need to be invited to follow Jesus Christ. So what's stopping you from following Jesus, I ask? And let me make it clear, there's only two answers. There's only two reasons people don't follow Jesus. I know it seems too simple, but there's two answers. Ignorance, because they don't know how beautiful Jesus is. They don't know how amazing he is. They don't know how much God loves them in spite of them. Or disobedience. It's ignorance or disobedience. 
No, I don't care that he loves me. I don't care that he died for me. I don't care. I'm going to live life my own way. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, Jesus gave a pretty clear command to those who were to carry on not just his teachings, but the message of the gospel that God intervened and did for you and I what we could not do for ourselves. And he says this in Acts 1.8, and I'm going to teach it the way I like to teach it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Luke is writing this. This is Jesus' words, and he says, but you will receive power. Say power. power. No, 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 that was weak sauce. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses in Santa Clara. You will be my witnesses in Sunnyvale. You will be my witnesses up in Alviso, yo, and to the ends of the earth. And so what Jesus said that his followers were, were witnesses. You know what a witness does in a courtroom? They testify, right? That's what they do. They testify, but what did they testify to? What they've experienced. So what have you experienced when it comes to Jesus Christ? When we share what we've been through and where we've been changed, people listen and they pay attention. I'll give you a great example. Last weekend, we added 27 new members to the church, okay? 27. Some of you are like, hey, I want to I be a member. Oh, cool. Email me. We'll do it, all right? But we added 27 new members, and in two different days, roughly 13 people or so in both meetings shared their testimony about how they met Jesus. And even though not everyone's testimony was exactly the same, there was a common theme for the most part. Here was the common theme. Uh, almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone grew up in the church or grew up in a church. And as they grew up in the church, they heard the word, they sang the songs, they clapped when they were supposed to, they did all the things they thought they were supposed to do, and then God intervened. You know what's crazy about that? God intervened in a church. What? Yes, he does that. And God intervened and started to change the souls and the perspective and the hearts of many of these people. And they started to worship Jesus with their lives. They started to follow Jesus with all that they were. Not perfectly. So please don't come in here and think that you have to be perfect. I'm the biggest sinner based on firsthand information in this room by far. Okay? Because I don't know your heart. I know mine. So you should say, no, 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 I'm the biggest sinner. Yes, you are the biggest sinner based on firsthand information because you know your heart. We don't. But these new members were testifying to what God had done in their life. And there was this common theme of people having God intervene and them experiencing life change because they started to do what God said. See, we don't testify to how great a program is or how great we are. You hear me? We, tr we testified to the transformational work of the gospel in the person of Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. Te biblical testimonies are about life transformation. That's what they are. The, word Jesus, or the name Jesus should be talked about more than the word me. You get that? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. We're going to finish these two verses, but look at it. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Some translations, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience, Peter says in verse 16, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. I have a conscience that is clear before the Lord when I come up here to preach to you. Because having the pews filled will just stroke my ego. But making sure that we are preaching this faithfully and allowing the word of God to sanctify you and even offend some of you. My conscience is clear before the Lord. And so when we speak of God, we don't share our faith because of guilt, because we feel like we have to, but out of a heart that is clear before the Lord, out of a, out of a want to tell others about the good news of what Christ has done for us. So let me, let me make it tweetable. We share Jesus with others because God shared his son with us. That's why. I, I don't know, if you know me well, you probably know this, but I tend to upset the same people over and over pretty much everywhere I go. Let me explain to you the people I tend to upset. And if you don't like me, then maybe I'm talking about you, all right? Those who want to make the gospel about human effort, they want to make it about cleaning yourself up, 
want to make it about doing all good things and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and basically telling the Lord, you're lucky to have me. That is not the gospel. And as Christians, we are defenders of the truth that Jesus is the point in everything. Relationship with God is demonstrated not by intellectual acceptance, but through faith in Jesus, God's only Son. The imperative word in that is demonstrated. In Acts chapter 26, verse 20, Paul, the apostle, he's been, been killing Christians before he knew Jesus. He was, he was trying to destroy this movement of Christians known as the way. And then Paul runs into Jesus in Acts 9, alive after Jesus' death. And he starts to have a conversation with him. And Paul didn't just stop killing Christians. He joined them, and he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And in the book of Acts, especially Acts chapter 9 and on, Luke writes about Paul's journey. And he is, like I've said before, a superhero. There was nothing you could do to Paul. If you try to kill him, he'd say, to die is gain. You let him live, he'd say, I'll live for Christ. You chain him up, he'll convert the guards. He didn't care because his perspective was eternal, and he's in a place where he's sharing with a king, and he's sharing with a bunch of other people what he's experienced, and here's what he says in Acts 26, verse 20. He says, first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, the non-churched people, if you will. I preach that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Can we just be honest? A lot of us attempt to demonstrate something that we've actually never done. Here's what I mean by that. For a lot of us, we've believed, but we've never repented. For a lot of us, we say, yes, Lord, I believe in you, but I haven't actually turned my heart to be of a disposition that says, not only do I believe you, but I do what you say. We've talked about this for many times, and for many people in the Church of America, it's all about belief. It's not about a repentive heart. In fact, James says that even the demons believe and they shudder. So Peter, the guy who wrote 1 Peter chapter 3, constantly stuck his foot in his mouth, loved this guy. Peter was preaching at Pentecost, which was a celebration of Passover, where God decided to pass over certain people who had put a blood of the lamb on their doorpost and would not kill their firstborn son. It's a long conversation. I'll teach it later. But Peter was at Pentecost And a bunch of people were speaking in different languages, and it wasn't a prayer language. It was different languages that people could understand. And so people started to speak in Latin, I'm guessing, in different dialects, and then people were like, oh, hey, I know what he's saying, even though I never learned that language. And it was crazy. And then Peter, because there was this inquisitiveness, I don't want you to miss this, there was an inquisitiveness. Peter, then filled with the Holy Spirit, stands up and talks to the crowd, and this is a mega church without microphones. And he starts to speak to them, and he points them towards the gospel, and he says, you all killed Jesus, but God raised him to life. And then one of the people yelled, what shall we do? Here was Peter's response. Verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I've heard this passage taught. I've taught it a hundred times. Here's what we tend to focus on. Let me show you. We focus on baptized. We focus on the name of Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with that. That's a very good thing, that your sins would be forgiven. Truly important that you could receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Incredibly important. But you know what we missed? The first thing he said, repent. Many of us stop at simple belief or intellectual acceptance, and we never continue on to repentance. Some of you are nodding your head going, yep, that's right, pastor. And some of you are thinking right now, is he saying that I'm not saved because I've never repented? Yes, I am. Let me be clear about that. What I'm saying is, depending on how you react to even me saying that, kind of shows where you're at. Because it is a repentive heart. It is a willingness to realize you're spiritually bankrupt without Jesus Christ. But then you can say, wait, 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 so we have to do something to be saved? No, I'm not saying that. And if you start to hear that I tell you you have to do a work in order to be saved, remove me as your pastor, okay? What I am saying is this, that when God draws you, he leads you towards repentance. 
When it's from God, you are led towards repentance. Let me show you in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. This is ESV, extra spiritual version. Paul says it this way in Romans. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? It's like Yoda, sorry. For the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. You guys see that? It is God's kindness that leads you and I to repentance. Not fear of hell, but God's kindness that he would intervene and come among us and live the perfect life we couldn't live and die the perfect death that we deserve to die. And he rose from the dead. I'm preaching better than you're responding. You just need to know that. (laughs) Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, (laughs) wow, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. This is written thousands of years ago, and yet it is so true today. And so many of us don't have a, have a sense of urgency, but here's what I can tell you, all right? We're not going to get into end times this week, all right? Sorry. But here's what I promise you, and I'm right. The day Jesus is coming back is closer today than it's ever been. You see that? Ha ha! I'm right. <laughs> and so many of us are not urgent, and we have an unrepentant heart, and we're just storing up God's wrath for us. God is way more patient than you or I, but even though he will often allow some to live most of their lives without him and will save some later on in life. You know, you've experienced this. You've seen this. I believe this happened to my mom on her deathbed, and I praise God for it. But so many of us don't live our lives for him, and what we really do is we start to despise or look down upon God's grace. We take it for granted. We never truly receive it through repentance, which is offered freely through grace and mercy, and if you, are, if you claim that you are in Christ, but you make things about you, you make a mockery of his church, and you make a mockery of his word, and he will ultimately give you what you deserve. And if that sounds like a threat, it ought to. Because I'm so glad God will not give me what I deserve, not because I'm a good person, but because I've received Jesus Christ through repentance. Let me, let me make it really clear, really tweetable. You ready? Because I'm sure everyone's on Twitter. You ready? No repentance, no mercy. No repentance, no mercy. So what does this have to do with how we share our faith? What does this have to do with how we tell others about Jesus Christ? Everything. Because if we're simply trying to share a canned message that we've memorized versus an expression of what we've experienced by actually being in a relationship with Jesus Christ, We really aren't doing what the Lord has asked us to do, and it will not justify us. So we ought to first make sure that we've set apart Christ as Lord. So, again, really like practical. When we're going to share, if we're going to share the good news of Jesus Christ, what do we share? All right? What do we share? The first thing we share, or the most important thing that we share, we can definitely testify to who we are or what God's done in our lives, but what we share is the gospel, Okay? So I'll give you some versions, if you will. Uh, He lived the life you couldn't live, died the death you deserved to die, physically rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, brought the kingdom of God here on earth, and we can be adopted into the family. That's part of the gospel. He who knew no sin became sin so that you and I could be the righteousness of God. Also the gospel. He did for you and I what we could not do for ourselves. Also the gospel. Here's my point. It's about him. All of it. So what do we share? The gospel. Here's the most important thing that I think much of the church of Jesus Christ has missed. What do we want them to do? Attend church and give money. No. I mean, yes, but no. (laughs) We want people to repent. We don't want them to just believe. The demons believe. I believed wrestling was real till I was 13. (laughs) That gets an amen? Really? We want people to repent. So let's get really clear on what repentance looks like because it actually looks like something. It's pretty important. Here, here's what repentance looks like. First, it looks like you're heartbroken over your sin. You're heartbroken over your sin. You realize that you've committed cosmic treason against a holy and perfect God who you deserve to not have a relationship with, and yet he shows grace and mercy upon you. Your heart is broken over your past sin. 
heartbroken over your sin, and you fall in love with God's Son. There is no one in heaven who's not in love with Jesus. Think about that for a second. There is no one in heaven who's not in love with Jesus. Even Abraham, who didn't know of him, trusted the future promises of what God would say and understood who that a Messiah was coming. There is no one in heaven who hasn't fallen in love with God's son. So, so let's get practical again, okay? Really big on practical, really big on, on really what we tend to do. And here, here's what we tend to do. We say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. And we start to follow him. And we start to do the things that he's asked us to do. And then he asks us to do something we don't really want to do, so we change direction. And then the world starts to look pretty enticing. Can we just be honest? Just me? Liars. Yeah. And the world starts to feel enticing and starts to want to encourage us to do things that we know, not just through God's word, but through the Holy Spirit who has changed our conscience. And we start to live the way the world would have us live. And then eventually we realize it's worthless and that we're broken and that we're in need of grace. And so we change direction. And here's the great thing about God. No matter how far you've ran from him, as soon as you turn around, he's right there to meet you. Wow. What a God. But then even after you do that and you have a mountaintop experience at a camp, what do you do? You go back to the world, don't you? You start to do this. And then you're like, ah, but I miss Jesus. And you start to do this. Then you're like, but the world, you know what you become? Dizzy. That's what you become. And when Jesus said repent, he didn't mean just start spinning around like a merry-go-round. He meant change direction, change your mind, allow me to give you a new heart, and I'll change you from the inside out. And if we were smart, Aaron would come up and start to play from the inside out, and we'd all get it on our face and start crying. But let me take you to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul says to the church in Rome, but he's really saying to those of us who know him and will know him, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I love this verse, and here's why. Because it's not just intellectual, it's responsive. If you declare with your mouth, there is a point, at some point, you have to say, yes, Jesus is my Lord, but you also have to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You know why he said heart? Because heart, biblically, is the control center of your personality, of your actions, and your perspective. That's why he said heart. Because the person in which you are is controlled by your heart, and that's why God gives us a new heart, because we cannot work our way to him. That's good. So how does a Christian know that they are right? How do we know that our faith isn't just like everyone else's? Because it is, if we're talking about being prepared with an answer, if we want people to hear the gospel and we want them to repent, how do we know that what we believe is actually true? Well, because the Bible says so. Hmm. I think there's more to it than just that. I think it's all based on one moment in history. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me show you in Scripture. Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, if Christ has not been raised, in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, it's worthless, it's in vain, and you are still in your sins. Think about that for a second, church. That you are still in your sins if Christ did not rise from the dead. I hope you hear this. Nothing is more important to God than the mission of seeking and saving what was lost. So if you're far from God, you're important to him. If you're included in Christ, you're important to him. And he wants to use you to reach people far from him. Nothing is more important to God than seeking and saving what was lost. But here's the thing. If that's true... Nothing should be more important to us than seeking and saving what was lost. Here's my personal mission. I think everyone should have like their own personal mission and get a t-shirt, all right? Personal mission, to raise awareness that Jesus Christ is alive. That's my personal mission. Not to just encourage people that God's nice. Not to just encourage people that the Bible's pretty cool but to raise awareness that Jesus is alive. I met with a missionary this week who has a true heart for Armenia, and I love Armenia because I grew up in a city where it was most of the American Armenians live. I said Armenians, not Armenians. Armenians. 
And that was a theology joke. Anyway, and where she has this heart to see many of these people come to know the Lord, and she's going to be out in Armenia, and we were talking about how to support her and things. And, but here's the thing. I'm kind of scary to missionaries, just so you know. And here's why. So if you're like, hey, I need to raise support, we'll have a conversation. But I started to ask her why she believed what she believed. <laughs> and I started to push on some of her arguments. And I started to push her, but eventually we got to the fact that the reason we believe what we believe is because Jesus Christ came out of that grave. And he's as alive today as he was on the third day. And so here's the thing. For many of us, we believe by faith, that Jesus rose from the dead. But I'm going to give you a really simplistic way of being defensive, not in a bad way, but in a good way, when it comes to the resurrection, all right? And I share this with the missionary, and I'm going to share it with you. There's usually these 13 facts I teach in my evangelism training, but I'm going to give you four. And these are incredibly important, but they answer every single argument against the resurrection. You ready? Here they are. First, there was an empty tomb. There was an empty tomb in Jerusalem in 33 AD after Jesus came out of the tomb. Now, here's the cool thing about these four. None of these things are supernatural by themselves, but they start to build a case. There was an empty tomb because, honestly, if people started to preach that Jesus was Lord and that he rose and he was still in the tomb, that wouldn't have gone very far, would it? But the tomb was found empty. Next, there was martyrdom of eyewitnesses. This isn't a a cult where people were willing to die because someone else convinced them. These were people that actually saw that Jesus was alive and were willing to die for it. And then there's James, Jesus' half-brother. Same mom, different dad. You guys get that, right? Who was Jesus' dad? Okay, just making sure. And James did not believe Jesus was God. I'm not going to be funny with this, but think about this for a second. James didn't believe his brother was God, and then he eventually followed Jesus as God. Imagine your sibling convincing you that they were God. Wow. And then lastly, Paul, the one who killed Christians and then switched teams, who was against Christianity, but then eventually started to proclaim that he had risen. So here's what I want you to know. If Jesus is alive and you have repented, you are included in Christ. If Jesus is alive and you have repented, you are included in Christ. But if he is dead or you haven't actually turned your life over to him, you are still in your sins and someone is going to pay for that sin. It's either going to be you or it's going to be Jesus. I would much rather have it be Jesus. Worship team, would you come on up? And I want to read a passage at the very end in 2 Timothy, and I'm going to allow the Word to just speak to us. I'm going to allow the Word to just talk to us versus me just interpreting it or explaining what all the words mean. I'm just going to read it, but here's my request of you, that you would hear what God has to say. Because Paul said this to this young pastor, Timothy, and he spoke these words, and they're as important today as they were when they were written many years ago. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and I need you to hear this, that often when I talk about what I'm about to talk about, um, stuff goes haywire. Someone fell down in first service. So just be prepared for something to happen, or just nothing will happen, but that would be awesome. But I'm about to talk about what I think is the most important thing eternally. 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says this, "'You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus.'" And the things that you have heard me say, George, you can make me sound spiritual, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Also, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, young Timothy, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. I love this, but God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
Here's a trustworthy saying, if we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we disown him, he also will disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, he names names, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness.